Welcome so much to today's WC for joining us for today's WCT webcast. What campus leaders need to know about copyright and in intellectual property. As we go through the webinar today, if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and enter them into the chat box. You'll see we've also posted a link to the slides, so you're welcome to download those and follow along. We'll hold questions till the Q&A portion, but we'll be keeping an eye on it too in case there's any questions that we need to stop the panelists to get to. Um, we have a pretty active Twitter back channel if you want to follow that discussion. The hashtag is WCET webcast. This is being recorded and we will make it available on our WCET website as well as our YouTube channel and we'll send you the link. Again, feel free to post any of your questions and we'll get to those after the, the conversation. And we are very thrilled to announce that we have a great partnership with VITAC who will be doing our live captions today. Failed to mention that my name is Megan and I direct our programs, sponsorship and membership here at WCET. If this is your first event with us, be sure to visit our website, which is wcet.wichi.edu. We have lots of great resources and uh, recording links to our previous webcasts. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce Rob Coyle, who is the Assistant Vice President for Course Development at University of Maryland Global Campus. Take it away, Rob. Oh, thank you so much, Megan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone today. Uh, we're going to start by having the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, and while they're doing the introductions, I'd like if you would just maybe give us a little teaser, uh, something that, tell us something that you wish that you had known uh, five, ten years ago, maybe uh, at the beginning of your career. Um, for those who, who are new or anything like me, who every time you learn something, you realize there's so much more to learn. I'd love to hear uh, what what's that nugget that we all really uh, should have had at the very beginning. Um, so, Jonathan, would you mind if we uh, started with you? Sure. And you want so um, so. My name is Jonathan Ports. I'm a professor of mathematics at Colorado State University in Pueblo, Colorado, um, and I'm the director of our Center for Teaching and Learning. I've worked in the OER space for quite a while now. Um, some, I came to my the thing I learned. Um, I came to OER from the open source software world. I'd done a lot of IT in my, in my life, and it was astonishing to me that a lot of the things that are happening in open educational resources and the open licensing and so on are perfect analogies to what's going on in open source software, um, which is a really a strange thing for a technologist to learn. Uh, that's great. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, how about Rebecca and then uh, Jim? Oh, looks like you're still muted there, Rebecca. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, Rebecca Vandevoort, I'm Assistant Vice President for Academic Outreach and Innovation at Washington State University and Director of Learning Innovations. Our uh, unit houses the WSU Global Campus, so I work significantly with um, online programs and courses. Uh, I, I think uh, I still have a lot to learn about copyright, and so every day I wish I knew exactly how to answer faculty questions about what they can and can't use and that's always a matter of context um, but I also wish that earlier on I had really understood um, Creative Commons what's free what's not free I was one of those who just kind of assumed if I could find it online it's free I can use it so uh, the, I, I like I like having some information and have way more to learn That's great. Thank you for that. Uh, Jim, please. I'm a partner in the intellectual property group at Thompson Coburn. When I started my career, I started doing work for Apple and started getting, I figured, copyright. Now, there's a real simple, easy to learn, easy to manage subject matter. And as Rebecca was saying, you find out when you stumble into it that it's a lot deeper and a lot more complex and subtle than you that it appears at first, first blush. Uh, yeah, thank you. And yeah, my experience definitely, uh, you know, uh, mirrors all of that. Um, and every time I try to learn something, I have some one of my compliance folks coming after me going, no, 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 Rob, Rob, Rob. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a never ending, um, but it, it's ultimately very fascinating and interesting area. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take uh, a few minutes. Uh, we have some uh, presentation um, that we're going to have uh, by Jim. 
uh, talking about copyright and some differences between uh, digital and face-to-face -face environments. Uh, and then following Jim's remarks, um, Jonathan's going to talk to you about an uh, overview of Creative Commons and some OERs. So, uh, Jim, take it away. Thank you, Rob. I have the unenviable task of attempting to teach you some copyright basics in seven minutes. When I was teaching at Georgetown, this what I'm about to talk took three two-hour sessions. So, copyright basics. It, the copyright provision or the intellectual property provision is both copyright and patents is a constitutional provision which says the Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. That's both copyright and patent. It's the progress of science, which is the copyright part, which to those of us in the 21st century it may not make sense, but back at the time they were writing the Constitution, progress of science meant learning, meant knowledge. Um, next, the objectives are twofold. You have to think of copyright as this balance between the rights of the users and the rights of the creators. It didn't come down from the mountain on tablets. Rather, it was a, 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 pro, a concept that came from English common law to make sure that people created works and that works got disseminated. Next, how did they do that? Well, they said, let's advance learning and incentivize creation at the same time. And the creators receive this bundle of exclusive rights, which we'll talk about in a moment, as well as for original creations. And we'll talk about that too. In addition to the limits on rights, facts, ideas, limited ways to express, which aren't included, a cornerstone of that balance is the exceptions to those rights particularly fair use. So there is balance between the rights of creators and the rights of users. Next slide, please. So let's dive a little deeper into Copyright 101. You're all copyright holders. Any, I'm sure all of you have written email, have written papers, have, have put down a tangible medium, which, believe it or not, a computer hard is a tangible medium. You, you automatically get a copyright as long as it's original. And originality is a pretty low bar. It means you didn't copy it from someplace else, that you, it's your own expression. There are limits on what can be protected. There's no protection for ideas, procedures, processes, systems, concept, principles, or discovery. Those are all the realm of patents, which I'm not going to go into. But you can understand that certain concepts don't get protected. Think of the literary heroic circle, that it certainly was as far back as Homer's Odysseus all the way through James Bond. No one can monopolize that concept of the hero or the star-crossed lovers from Romeo and Juliet to West Side Story. You can't own that. You can certainly, your expression of those ideas is what you get copyright for. So it gives, next, it gives authors actually six rights. I, I try to always ignore the music rights because it's most complicated. But for limited times, slow down a little bit, sorry. It's life plus 670 years, which some of us thought wasn't too limited, but the Supreme Court said that was limited. So the first right is the right of reproduction, making copies, obviously. The second one is prepared derivative works. Think of the series of Pirates of the Caribbean. Each one builds on the prior one. Then distribute copies. Normally that's licensed out to a publisher. Next to publicly perform the work, think of a play, and publicly display the works. What I left out was a digital audio transmission of a sound recording. Now you can imagine that's something recent with putting music on the internet, which we won't get into, but it is an exclusive right. So the rights are subject to a number of exceptions, such as classroom use, first sale, but what we're gonna focus on today in the limited time we have is fair use. Fair use is centuries old. It was originally created by the courts and put into law in 1976 with the 76 Copyright Act. And again, it was part of that idea of balance that certain uses would not be an infringement. But the good news is it's very flexible. The bad news is you have to look at each case. So this is the preamble. And I just want to boringly read through it. Notwithstanding the creator's rights, that 106 list of rights I read you, the fair use of a copyrighted work, including such use by reproduction and copies or by any other means specified by that section, the exclusive rights section, for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, 
teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship or research, is not an infringement of copyright. Then, it, so you don't automatically get a pass if you're using it in teaching because it says in determination whether the use made of a work in any case is a fair use, the factors to be considered shall include, now hold on before you go on, that's in any case. So you have to go through these four factors even if it's an educational use. The first factor is the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or for nonprofit, nonprofit educational use. I want to point out, it's important to note that commercial use isn't automatically a negative and education use isn't automatically a positive in looking at this first test. The Supreme Court and courts, hold on a sec, sorry. The Supreme Court and courts recently, since 1994, have looked at whether it's a transformative use. Are you using the copyrighted work for something different than the purpose of the copyrighted work. For example, the case, the seminal case in 1994, the Campbell case, Two Live Crew used a huge amount of Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman, but they did it as a parody. It wasn't a substitute, it was a new use. And so transformative use is what court looks, looks for. It still can be a fair use, even if it isn't transformative, but you really need to look at the character of the use. Now the next fair use factor is the nature of the copyrighted work. Is it factual or fictional? Factional work, factual works get less protection, but if it's a transformative use, the second factor is rarely considered. As one of my favorite judges said, the second factor is not very helpful in separating the infringing goats from the non-infringing sheep. The third factor is the amount and substantiality, the quantity and quality of the portion you used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. So in Pretty Woman, they used most of it, but in a transformative work, you're allowed to use as much as is necessary to do the transformation. But I'll give you an example of one that I thought was an easy slam dunk. There was a documentary which was about burlesque and they used eight seconds of a children's song. The children's song was 120 seconds. And the court said, nobody is gonna buy for their kids a, a documentary about burlesque to hear eight seconds of the song. The final one is also a heavyweight compared to the second and third, which is the effect of the use upon the potential market for value, for or value of the copyrighted work. In other words, are you substituting your work for the copyrighted work in the marketplace? That is almost for sure is gonna get you into trouble. But if you have no effect like the eight seconds of a children's song in a movie about burlesque, is not going to affect no one's going to no one's going to buy that movie for their kid to get eight seconds of a song that you want the whole song for so those are the four factors there's, there's a fifth footnote that if we had time i'd explain it. it isn't terribly important but it's a joke on me i told the panel earlier you can ask that as a question later thank you rob that was close to seven minutes oh that was great thank you very much i really appreciate the uh the discussion around fair use that's one of the most understood things in my experience. And I'm definitely gonna have a, a follow-up question for you and the rest of the panelists later about that. Um, so now, uh, just before we get into the discussion, uh, Jonathan's gonna share a few slides with us and talk us through a couple of things around Creative Commons and OER. So Jonathan, please. Great, thank you. So um, let's see, so I wanna give you a kind of an alternative to the all rights reserved copyright um, picture that was just described by Jim. Um, and so let's see, so what is Creative Commons is an organization was founded um, basically when uh, they tried to prevent the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998 from going into what's also known as the Mickey Mouse Protection Act by some people because it, it kept Mickey Mouse uh, uh, from going into the public domain. And uh, Larry Lessig and others founded the Creative Commons organization because they felt that the internet is allowing ease of, of creation and sharing of, of content. And as Jim pointed out, almost everything you do automatically falls under copyright. And so there's all this copyrighted content and people often don't want it to have copyright protections. They want more flexibility. And so the way to think about this, so I sort of made a graphic here, is this sort of spectrum that goes from on the top here, public domain. There are two sort of symbols that we use in the Creative Commons world to indicate public domain. And all the way down at the other end, there's all rights re reserved copyright. So the all rights reserved is the kind of complete control that Jim was describing. And at the 
is in public domain. These are works that maybe the copyright has expired or you've given away your copyright control and they're completely free to be used by anyone and there are no restrictions whatsoever. And so Lessig and colleagues tried to make a set of specific licenses that you can attach to your work, which will give away most of those rights or some, you know, it's called some rights reserved by some people. It gives you some specific set of rights rights you may choose to give to the public without really any um, necessary negotiations or contracts. You just attach one of these licenses to your work and you give away those particular rights. So the, the default you should think of um, is that the rights are all given away, those six rights that Jim was talking about, but maybe you um, make some requirement using the power of copyright as kind of one of those it's a sort of hoist by your own petard sort of situation. They're using the powers of copyright to make um, specific anti-copyright kind of provision. So just quickly to run down the, what the provisions you can, you can um, give away or keep using d different Creative Commons licenses. There's the one called CC BY. BY means that you have to give credit to the original author or the creator of the work. And that's kind of, I view this as sort of enforcing in the law good ethics in uh, academia. You know, we, we always tell our students, cite your sources, right? So now legally you are required to cite the source if the source is a, is a, is a material which has a CC BY license on it. You may want to maybe force your work to remain in the open community and if someone takes you, so you've given away the rights to publication and public performance and copying and the creation of derivative works. Um, but maybe you, want, maybe you want to give people the right to do that, but you don't want them to make a derivative work and put it under all rights to reserve copyright. So you want it to be kept, it and all of its children should be um, in the open community. So you can use an essay or a share alike license, which requires derivative works to be released Anyone can make them, but they must be released under exactly the same license. Um, there are two more kind of general clauses. There's the NC clause, which maybe you say, I'm willing to give this work to the world without hoping to make profit from it because it's freely distributable, freely copyable, but it would sort of bother me if someone else made money off of my work. So that would be a way of distributing something and you forbid other people to use it for profit making. They can still earn back, you know, you can, a college bookstore can, copy works that are under a CC by NC license and charge the students the reproduction cost. It's about, it, it's if they charge above that and ask for a profit, then they get into trouble. Um, and then there's the last clause. Um, they, some of these clauses occur in combinations. Um, but anyway, the last new idea is a no derivatives work, which I don't really like very much, but it means you do not permit anyone to make a derivative work from your work. Maybe, so I've heard people say, have their students tells personal stories on a public website and maybe put a CC license on it. And you don't want someone like distorting your story, some student telling a very painful personal story they don't want it retold in a slightly different way that had cast them in bad light. So maybe that student would choose to use a CC by ND derivatives license. So um, please move to the next slide. So um, the, um, Let's see, so a couple things to notice about that, um, that CC licenses are built on top of copyright. So this is a huge issue actually in the world at the moment. So in the big pivot to online, lots of people want to use openly licensed things. You have to own the copyright on a work to put a CC license on it. So on my campus, contingent faculty do not own the intellectual property of the curriculum materials they produce. So they cannot exercise the authority to put it under a Creative Commons license. It would have to be the Board of Governors of the Colorado State University system would have to choose to uh, put these things under an open license. Um, the also, since they were built on double copyright, as Jim said, uh, fair use is an exception built into copyright law. If someone wants to use a work that I have put out in the world with a Creative Commons license, they want to use a little bit of it, um, some portion following those that, that four-step test that Jim mentioned using fair use, they don't have to follow any of the restrictions I put in my Creative Commons license choice. They can use it for profit making, they can make derivatives, they don't have to use this, and all of those provisions are sort of exempted. Um, and I, as Jim mentioned, CC license apply to expressions of, of things, not to ideas. So, you know, you can rewrite someone else's book um, using all the same ideas, you just can't use the same expression. So that's a kind of thing that's it's it's important because people think that unless it has a Creative Commons license, I can't you know, say the same things as this other math textbook. Well, math is ideas, and so you can write a new math textbook. You don't need those CC licenses. Uh, last comment here, CC licenses are irrevocable. Once there's something out which has a license on it, you can't, if someone finds a copy of it on the internet with that license on it, they can follow the terms of that license. You can't change your mind and say, I don't want to give away all those, those rights. So, um, 
But on the other hand, you can do whatever you want if you're the rights holder. So if I release my work with an NC license, that doesn't prevent me from making a profit myself off of selling my work. Okay, go to the next slide, please. So a common way that, um, that um, uh, CC licenses are used in the educational world is through open educational resources. There's a definition um, from the Hewlett Foundation, which I won't read through. It's the thing to notice is that it's uh, resources for use in education that are permit free use and repurposing. So they're, un, they're released under an intellectual property license that permits free use and repurposing. So if you think about it, they're really saying it should be under something like a Creative Commons license. So that's the basic idea of open educational resources. Could you please go to the next one? Um, right, so, uh, so let's see. So the, the, the free repurposing, um, and there's another definition widely used in the OER community, open educational resources community due to David Wiley called the five R's. And the five R's of OER are that you should have the right to retain, reuse, um, re, I can't, I can't read that screen, remix, redistribute, and uh, revise the, um, uh, revise the, the, the work. So these are again, incorporating all of the CC licenses, except the licenses that have the no derivatives clause. Those are not considered OER. But anyway, um, those, that's another way of saying the rights that you will want to have over something for it to be in OER. And um, if you think about it, that really amounts to kind of academic freedom in the pedagogical context. You know, if, if my chair of my department came in and told me how to teach my class, I would be annoyed. I would say, you can't do that because of academic freedom. Textbooks under, under all rights reserved copyrights are someone else telling me how to run my teaching. And uh, it's only if it has a work has an, uh, an open license on it that it is free in the academic freedom kind of sense. Um, another amount of the, another use of the word of free is to do with cost. And so um, I'm sure you're all aware the costs of textbooks has risen at basically three times the rate of inflation for, for a generation. Uh, textbooks, my institution says the students should put aside $1,800 per year for uh, cost of textbooks and other supplies. It, there are $500 economics textbooks that are being required at some business schools around the country. So it just seems insane that we that students have to pay that amount of money. The current student debt, which I looked up just a few days ago, is $1.74 trillion with a T. And in addition, in additionally, many students are um, food and housing insecure. On my campus, 17% of the students were homeless at some point in the last year. This is a, also interesting enough, the same as the average for all of the higher ed across the United States. So when I look at a classroom of 25 students, my classes typically have around 25 or 30 students, I know that there are several students, you know, more than a handful, who have probably been homeless. And it's hard to tell a homeless student that they should spend $350 on a calculus textbook rather than finding some shelter. Um, so free is, as in cost nothing, is a really important thing for our students. Um, and there's a nice thing when you switch from commercial books to OE, using the OER, there have been some very wonderful studies that show academic and performance improves and improves in particularly well for uh, minority and uh, self-identified minority and Pell eligible students. So it's kind of a thing you can do which automatically helps equity of education. So could you go to the next slide, please? I think I have a, yeah, so, um, so I just wanted, so this is a summary. There are lots of, there, OER, it sound, may sound like a pipe dream, but there are lots of OER in the world. They exist in many different uh, fora, on many different platforms. Um, there are places to search for them. It's a little less well-organized than the kind of top five commercial textbook publishers, um, but there are search engines which can find things. We know that OER has saved students around a, a, at least a billion dollars across the United States. Um, the, the, if you look, if you download these slides, there are wonderful things you can click on to, to search for OER and use them. Could you go to the next slide, please? Um, so, let, just let me uh, handle some some misconceptions about OER. So, people say that. Um, let's see. So, some people say that OER um, don't have it. Well, this is unfortunately somewhat true. That there may be not as many supplementary materials, text, test banks, automatic online homework systems, and so on. Um, that is true. In the OER world, we call this is the, the, the ancilla problem, the ancillary materials. There aren't quite as many of them. The community is working very hard to make them very quickly. So there are, there are more and more of them uh, you know, available. And then um, people have a concern about the ADA compliance, the disability accessibility of uh, OER. I think that's actually false. I've worked with commercial publishers in my career, and I don't think that there's any reason to believe that OER are less accessible. My students, when they have a commercial textbook, but we buy an electronic copy and they, we run it through a screen reader if they're visually impaired. You can do exactly the same thing, only you don't have to buy it. You just download it if it's an OER. 
Um, and then there's a, finally, there's a kind of ideological issue, which is most people think you get what you pay for. And since OER costs nothing, it must be worth nothing. I mean, I think that's kind of weirdly contrary to the academic worldview. You know, we share our day ideas. I don't make money for my scholarly publications. Why should I make money? Why should we believe that they're valuable so they're distributed to the world for free? So we have to change uh, the, the viewpoint of people. I think that might be my last slide. It sure is. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was some great insight there. And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, to some of the questions. I know I'm going to plant the seed um, for you and the rest of the panelists. We've had one question come in about copyright and YouTube videos. So we're going to hang on to that until we get to the uh, to the question and answer session. But you can start wrapping your mind around that. Um, so we've got about 18 minutes left uh, for group conversation um, before we get into the Q&A. So I'd like to start, um, let's just, you know, signs of the times, what's happening right now uh, in our world with this mass move to uh, remote learning. Some, uh, I'm seeing articles about folks who are acknowledging that remote learning maybe isn't exactly online learning and they're trying to, to pivot a little bit further. Um, and obviously there's huge implications here um, for copyright and, uh, and intellectual property. Jim touched a little bit on it um, as we talked about both from moving from face to face to online. Um, so if we can start, uh, Rebecca, with you actually, since we haven't heard from you much yet, um, what is your experience um, that you're seeing the conversations you're having around you know this pivot that's happening right now? So sure, and I just, um, before I answer your question, Rob, I wanted to add one thing to Jonathan's uh, OER conversation, we have a couple of global campus degrees that are built totally around OER. And one of the things that we hear from students that they find um, really valuable is that those materials are developed exactly for that course. And it's not like you're using, you know, most of the text or, I mean, they've, they comment often in their course evaluations how much they appreciate that all the resources they use are exactly applicable to their course. And so I think that's another advantage. Um, in terms of what we're doing at Washington State University, we're preparing for some mix of online and face-to-face -face, uh, this coming fall. For those of you that don't know, we do have six different campuses, a global campus and then five physically located campuses. Those campuses are all located in different counties. Those counties are all in different phases. So what they can do and how many people can gather um, is, is making the conversation more complex. So we've run um, what we're calling the fall prep cohort. We have an, about between 200 and 250 faculty who have been meeting with instructional designers weekly to talk about really how to, uh, how to manage synchronous versus asynchronous classroom versus out of the classroom, what they're gonna do hybrid, what they might be able to do in the classroom. Um, but a lot of that conversation really is how to reach students at a distance and how to provide content at a distance because that's where the unknown is. And around intellectual property and copyright, we're getting a lot of questions um, about how to replicate what they do in the classroom. And so I, I did have a, a, a question for James on this as well. When you talk about multiple copies in the classroom, many faculty provide a handout of an article in the physical classroom. So multiple copies in the classroom, does that translate to posting that article in a digital course space? That's a question we get a lot. We get the question a lot, how much is under the fair use? How much can I use? 10%, 15%? That goes to my earlier comment about sort of context and, and not knowing enough because that's never a clear black and white answer, but um, anything that can help guide that decision-making process is helpful. Um, and then the other question we get and, and the challenge oftentimes of moving things online is the library may own the video, students can check it out, but now can we put that video in the online environment? Um, or I as a faculty member may have purchased that video and I take it and show it in my class. Now, now what do I do? So really talking through the kind of content you bring into the classroom and how you're gonna present that in the digital environment does bring up a lot of copyright questions. 
Boy, that's a, that is the rest of the semester for <laughs> Copyright 101. Those are great questions. And I wish I could give you this nice, simple answer. But just to show you the difficulty of it is the Georgia State case, which is now before the district judge for the third time because the Circuit Court of Appeals said, Your Honor, didn't look at each example and examine each example under the four-factor test and look at the results holistically, not mechanically. And so she, her latest opinion is 245 pages. I, you know, I, I wish, I wish Rebecca, I could give you a simple answer. That's why I answered Rob's question. I wish I'd known how complicated this is. And, and you know, one of the things that the copyright lawyers amongst themselves are musing is in COVID, in the age of COVID, does, does fair use become more flexible or not? We don't know the answer to that. One would think, and, and they have to state this very carefully because I don't want people running out and doing stuff. Whatever you could do in the classroom, as long as you restricted it carefully to the students in your class, you ought to be able to do online. But I said ought to. And the problem is, are you going to get sued? Which, of course, no university wants to get sued because it's not fun. And then you get in front of a judge. Are you going to be able to persuade the judge? Look, Your Honor, I was able to hand out physical copies of this article in my classroom. My kids can't come to school. We have a, a state mandatory stay at home restriction. I'm just doing the same thing. It's limited, it's locked down, only the students in the class. I, I'd like to take that case on, but can I tell you, Rebecca, yes, you're gonna win that case. I can't, because that's the problem with fair. The, the, the strength of it is it may be flexible enough, but the weakness is I gotta look at each case. Certainly, it seems to me that if you took an entire textbook, and put it online for anybody to access a copyright textbook. That's clearly not fair use. So I can tell you the extremes. So could I jump into section? So one of the things that, that's wonderful about Creative Commons licensing is that it takes all this worry off the table, right? So the person who asked, can you, do, can you play a, video, a YouTube video for your class? Well, you can search under YouTube for video, very, one of, you can pull down and restrict your search to Creative Commons licensed videos. Um, so I have 850 classroom videos that are on YouTube. They're all Creative Commons licensed. So um, if you, once you have that license, you automatically know that you can copy it, you can pro publicly perform it. And you know, if you wanna make a derivative work of an existing video, that's a different question. Maybe, it, maybe the license restricts that. But typically, um, the, the, all of these questions, how much can I copy? You know, what are, do I need to lock in a public website about it on my LMS? Those questions all disappear if the work is Creative Commons licensed. So it's really a great, um, worry saver for us in academia. Uh, Jonathan, I um, found your comment really, I really appreciated your comment about uh, the research publications that you produce from your research, you don't get paid for. My other thought about comparing OER and saying that it's not a value because it's free has always been that's kind of ironic because it's the same faculty who write OER as who write textbooks. And it's not generally the faculty who are making a lot of money from that anyway, it's all of the added publisher pieces that add, contribute to the cost. So, so the expertise really is the same. Yeah, I think that, you know, writing a textbook, people, it's the same reason people play the lottery. Every once in a while, someone is gonna make that textbook which is ordered thousands of copies and you'll buy your vacation at home based on your, your mm -hmm. royalties. But I'm the great majority, I mean, I've written a commercial book. My wife has written several of them. I think my wife's average income per, per book she's written is $3,000, so. The, by the way, the YouTube issue, I think you've got a great answer to it, Jonathan, but if there isn't Creative Commons videos, I, there's nothing wrong with embedding the URL as opposed to the video itself. Because, and, and there was a question we could get to later about YouTube and copyright, which is again, a, a couple hour discussion. We can try and do it in a few minutes. So uh, you already touched on the, the magic 15% that I've been, I've heard that number for for I don't know how many years, decades, I guess. Uh, and, and I've even heard lawyers back in the day mention that 15%, which now I think we have a better understanding. Um, and also, Rob, that, that, yeah. that's what part of the whole Georgia State case was. You can't use a number. Right. You have to look at each 15%. Right. So, um, so that kind of leads me to um, this next question. I, as I'm seeing the questions come in, um, 
uh, from those who are participating with us, uh, I'm seeing a theme, I think, around, well, how do we do these evaluations, right? You talked about that we need to av uh, evaluate holistically, that there's these four things. I mean, what, are the, what are the things that we should be looking for? What are, what are those big ticket items that we can say, you know, check, 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 oh, this is a problem. Um, how can we, you know, uh, as consumers who are trying to put content in our courses, um, really get a, get a jump start on what we can and can't use? Um, Rebecca, would you mind starting with that? And then we'll just kind of run from there and see where the conversation goes. Um, well, I probably would defer more to the expert, but I will say one of the things that I do talk to faculty about and have learned from our attorney general is, is the first question really is, is this for educational purposes? If you're just putting a cartoon on your homepage so that students kind of have a laugh as they enter the course, but it's not actually related to the goals of the course, the learning outcomes of the course, that's not for educational purposes. So I think that's the first question um, that, we, that we take to faculty. To, if you're gonna stand up in front of a judge, as Jim talked about, and argue your case, What's the educational outcome? Why is this material critical to be produced in your course space? And then always looking, so we, we tend to fall back on what we've been using, but are there OERs that have been developed? Are there new OERs that are out there? They're being developed all the time. So maybe, maybe this YouTube video is one you've really liked, but you can't use it now. And so are there some that are a better alternative with? with better copyright, it's not really the right word, but. Yeah, a couple things to look for are, are you using the whole work, the entire work? And, and again, there, there are instances where you can, that's why I say it's not easy to give you a, a bright line answer. And I think you really put your finger on the other piece of it, which is, is this for an educational use where you just wanting to amuse your students? which all of us are guilty, even I was guilty of that as a teaching at Georgetown. I, I really think that, that you have to look at each example. That's what makes it difficult. Also, the other thing is absolutely restrict it to your class. Never put it up publicly, whatever it is, unless it's your own or it's Creative Commons. And I, I think, um, Jim, you talked about this with the YouTube link. I think talking a little bit more about the difference between copying the, the video and putting it in a space versus just providing the link. So then if someone else goes to YouTube and says, I own the copyright for this and I don't want it up and publicly available, they pull it down and now that link is no longer active right. as opposed to you having to figure that out and pull it down from your course. We do the same thing with library articles. We have that conversation with faculty a lot. They want us to, the library owns the article. They want us to embed the actual article in the course space. Our argument is twofold. One, that that's not what the copyright allows. But second, if students, if we guide students to the library to find the article, that's a learning experience for them. And so sometimes providing these things directly isn't, isn't necessarily in the long term. It might be the most efficient, but in the long term, it might not be the best for the students. You can give some, provide some learning opportunity by having them find material, having them find a video around this topic, those kind of things. So can I point out, so there's a, an interesting thing, the, the internet is so global, so sometimes, I mean, a lot of the discussion we've had so far is around U.S. copyright law, and I think that if you have students who are not, um, maybe in an all online pivot, that you students who are taking the course but are located in Beijing or in Denmark or in some other country, so there is a, you know, so here's interesting, the, the fair use um, varies quite a bit from just, to, just jurisdiction to jurisdiction, so the US, the UK, and Canada have quite similar fair use. Um, uh, civil law countries like most of continental Europe have quite a different thing. Actually, fair use is called fair dealing in the British Commonwealth. And there are some countries which have very specific lists. It's not, as, as Jim was pointing out, fair use is nice because it's flexible, but that's scary because you have to interpret it. So there are other countries that have very specific and very powerful um, uh, fair use kind of provisions in Japan, for example, the educational fair use is kind of you can do whatever you want with any copyrighted material, however you want. 
for it in the in the classroom at Grant Educational. There is no, there's a very, a very broad educational for you. So I think that's another issue that we have to think about when we have international students and when we're delivering college courses, maybe to a satellite campus or to, to um, other locations that other legal systems have to worry. And if, I don't want to keep sounding like I'm, I'm making money by selling you Creative Commons, but um, the Creative Commons licenses were developed to be valid in all of the Bern Convention countries, which 178 countries around the world who have saw, signed this uh, common um, treaty about the interpretation of copyright law. So the Creative Commons license have been tested around the world. And so those kinds of things, unlike fair use, can be thought of as working across jurisdictions. So in our last couple of minutes, I really want to just get some final thoughts before we get into our questions from, from the three of you. Um, what are we telling our folks? Like, what is the message right now as many of our colleagues are looking to pivot, um, you know, for the fall, they're scrambling right now. Um, you know, what, what are the, what is that key message um, that, you know, we should impart on them um, as they're, as they're going through this journey? Jim, you want to, would you yeah, mind? I think the key, the key message is one, people don't want to hear, talk to your lawyer. I mean, <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully, universities and colleges are working or already have rules of the road here. And you know, not that everyone is going to be perfect, but hopefully, the university or college council has looked at it carefully. And if you have any doubts, ask because it's it is a minefield out there. And just the one little kicker to this is statutory damages. Are, could be as much as 150,000 per, not per copy, but per infringement of work. So if you've got like Cox, who was found guilty of, I think, I forgot how many, how many it was, but it was like $1.5 billion in statutory damages. So I don't mean to scare you and push you towards Jonathan's creative comments, but you want to be careful is, is basically my message. Um, so I, let's see. So I would I would say I think I, I totally agree with that I think uh, always talk to your lawyers. They know a lot more than 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 we do. The the damage that damages can be scary. The Houston Independent School District paid a nine million dollar settlement for a rather egregious violation of copyright law, um, just in the last year. Um, that's not that's K through twelve. It's not higher ed, but the same kind of thing could easily happen in the higher ed. I think the big takeaway I would say here is we're in a kind of crisis moment, and lots of people there are lots of juicy quotes about a crisis or opportunities, and there are moments of danger. This whole idea of crisis capitalism, the shock doctrine kind of thing. I think we can pivot either a lot of a lot of services are being offered for free in the short term, right? I mean, you can get addicted to some service, which is wonderful for free during the during the crisis moment. Um, and then when the crisis eases up a little bit, hopefully we'll have a vaccine and everyone will go back to normal um, that that will lock into some of those sort of their expense become the expensive uh, solutions to these uh, pedagogical issues. I think we could use this moment also to pivot towards more openness, more commonly sharing, more CC licensing of all the curriculum materials I produce so that my colleagues at many other universities could use and using other people's resources rather than using expensive alternatives. So I think that's the big crisis point. I'm constantly talking to my colleagues and the leaders on my campus to try to get us to go towards open as opposed to commercial solutions. And I would say we encourage faculty not to make assumptions not to just assume that they can do what they've been doing, even in the classroom, um, not to use for educational well, purposes as sort of a catch-all, it's not always gonna fly, and to do their research. You can, not every faculty member can get access to our attorney generals, um, but they can read about fair use, they can read about examples of cases, they can, inform themselves and and we always encourage people to look first at creative commons licenses and so those are our tips well, that that's wonderful thank you um and uh so now that we've scared everyone by saying go talk to your lawyers maybe we can <laughs> answer some questions here uh, uh and and sort of help folks understand some of the things that they can do um a couple of questions that i've seen uh sort of um revolve around where can we get resources, where can we direct our faculty to find things. Um, I know, uh, you know, the slides uh, that 
uh, Jim and Jonathan share. They have, there were some examples in there, and I believe there were some links if you download the slide um, on where you can find some, some additional things. Um, any of you have any other kind of thoughts on uh, where, you know, a good place that we can not only point the folks listening to this webinar, but where they can go to find the things that they can share with their faculty, other than the lawyer's office? Well, if I, I would say I think that some of the, the links on the slides uh, are, are pretty good and give you a lot of first places to start. I think that the other thing I find is that it, the, the communities that are sharing resources, um, open resources, uh, are really valuable. There are organizations that promote um, building a community. There's the Open Textbook Network, which is becoming the Open Education Network, which is a membership organization that, that educates faculty and administrations about how to use open resources. There's the Rebus Foundation in Canada. There are a number of the Spark, the library organization based in DC. There are a number of organizations. And if you can get some people on your campus to get some training and um, to, to build networks with those communities, then you know, typically when a colleague of mine asks me, I need a book that does exactly this. Is there an OER that does that? I go to my fa fa for same three websites and search for it. If I don't find exactly what they look for, I post it on a listserv from one of these organizations. And then there's so much expertise that comes immediately to help me with that. So I would encourage people to uh, get people on your campuses who have expertise who can then use those networks. You know, Rob, that's a good question. And I, I, I tend to be so deep in the weeds that I am not familiar with a sort of a high level fair use course. Uh, other than looking at one of the legal textbooks, I think that's too too heavy for, I wouldn't even want to do that if I were trying to look at fair use. I'll think about it and if I can follow up with something, I'll let you know, but I don't know anything that's, that's you know, of general interest. I, I don't remember exactly um, which, uh, but I, I did a course, it was a Coursera or edX or one of those courses on fair use. There are some out there um, that are not, to totally complicated? So the American University Washington College of Law um, is putting out resources on fair use for use in higher education. Their, their big one is not out yet, but I, they promise in another couple of months. So it, it's um, auw.cl slash OER, and they have some recorded webinars on fair use in education, and they will, they'll be posting their resources there. Yeah, I, I would heartily second that. Peter Jassy is a professor and a fair use expert is really good. But as you said, I haven't seen a, that next iteration. Great, okay, thank you both. Um, so the next question, uh, and I, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but let's just focus on it and hit it home. Um, there's several questions about YouTube videos or things that are on YouTube, TEDx talks that we might be able to find. Um, you know, what, what do we need to know about YouTube videos what do we look for? What can we do with them, right? If, can we embed them? Can we link to them? Are they off limits? So, so uh, yes. Yeah. This, this is a good question, Rob, and it's still, there's a lot that isn't settled yet on this. That's why I said this, the safest way is to just use the URL. I mean, as we know, a lot of content has been put up on YouTube that is infringing, but YouTube has come, normally what's supposed to happen is the copyright holder gives YouTube a notice saying that you, this URL has my content on it and it's infringing and YouTube has to expeditiously take it down. They've actually been quite good at taking it down, but it's a case of whack-a-mole. I mean, as soon as something down, it appears again. So they've got a deal with the content providers called Content ID, which allows YouTube to match up the content with the owner and pay it a portion of the ads that appear around the content and they give YouTube a pass. Now, it doesn't mean you can embed that content itself in your materials. And the whole issue of embedding has become complex in the law. It, it used to be that if you just, you know, I don't know if all of you understand how embedding works, but basically what you do is you put the URL in there, but when it, it goes out to the server and brings the image up embedded in your content. So it's part of what you see. That used to be considered not infringing, but there's a couple decisions in the Southern District that now say that may be infringing. So it's a little bit dangerous to embed content. There's a, just to jump in, the, the, the TED 
TED videos are all CC licensed, so you can use them however you want. They're licensed CC by ND, interestingly enough. They don't want you to make uh, new derivative works of them, but you're allowed to do public performances. So for that particular resource, any TED video can be publicly performed and uh, used however you want, but just don't make a modification of it. Um, and the thing about links, I mean, it's interesting, I'm part of playing again the, the, the same tune I was playing before about global concern. So the European Union is in the process of doing a major revision of its copyright law. And when that goes into effect, the status of links will change in Europe, that links will not be as free of any copyright consequences as they are at the moment. So this is a kind of thing that again, we have to worry about global concerns. Could one of you speak to the difference between um, uh, copyright and trademark? There was uh, two questions related to that. Uh, uh, I'm afraid this is going to be another, you know, uh, we need a whole semester lecture to, <laughs> to cover this. Um, but maybe, it, you know, there are a few sound bites that we could share today. Well, the difference is copyright protects original expression. And I said the bar for originality is quite low, although the phone book doesn't qualify. But no matter how hard it is to make a phone book, it isn't original. But trademark is to protect your brand, your reputation. In other words, the, the idea of trademark is that you've created a brand like Nestle. And you don't, you know, and that supposedly has built up over the years as something very valuable, that it means something to consumers. That brand is protected. It may not be a copyright violation to write an article about Nestle and use the word Nestle in it a lot, but it is a trademark violation if you try to pass off your goods using Nestle's trademark. That's great. Um, we've got another question here, and, and this one just amuses me. Um, uh, if you're gar if you're using, say, cartoons or you know images in the classroom, uh, you know, in your online classroom. Is it is it okay to put your grumpy cat pictures up there as long as you're crediting the uh, you know the original creator? Well, I think Rebecca put her finger on it before. If it's used pedagogically, you're using it to make a point, to like you know the cartoon you're teaching on a course on inter internet safety, and you put up the cartoon. Every, nobody knows you're a dog on the internet. You know I think you could relate that to the lesson. But if you just put it up there to get a chuckle and then move on to talk about trademark or something, I think that's problematic. Uh, I've got a, another couple of questions here that seem to relate to uh, what about content that we we create as faculty members? You know, if we're creating stuff, um, or you know, is that is that okay to to put up? Does that if I'm putting stuff up online now on university systems, am I transferring my rights over to the university? Um, and similar question I saw come in around uh, student work. Uh, you know, if, if students are creating e portfolios and things like that as part of their assignments, um, you know, what are the implications of that? It's going to depend on your relationship with the university. Generally speaking, and this is not about universities, but about business, if you're creating copyrighted material in the course of your work as part of your job assignment, that's called a work for hire. And unless your agreement with your employer says differently, your employer owns the copyright. Uh, I think universities and professors have very close relationships and have agreements, particularly for textbooks, that professors get the copyright. It's not a work for hire, but it's gonna depend on your relationship. And I think this is kind of where I talked earlier about doing your research. So your university should have in the faculty policy manual what the faculty copyright law is. We also at WSU have an OER policy that establishes if you create OER um, under grant funding from the university, that material belongs to the university. The university has stipulated that it will be licensed under CC by uh, or CC by SA. So you need to do your research and understand what the, the rules and policies are in your location. I would add that um, it, 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 it's really interesting to actually look at those agreements. Some of them are, I mean, I, I think Jim and Rebecca both maybe mentioned how it's hard to look at these things and they're really confusing and technical, but I've looked at the contract, the details of the contract on my campus and the IP, the intellectual property policy and it's a mess. Um, it, it says contradicting things, contradictory things in different places in the contract. So 
I think it's worth looking at and worth, um, I think the, the, the common academic exception to the works for a higher doctrine is typically for tenured faculty at um, four-year institutions. I, I, my community college faculty friends, very few of them have the, the, into the rights to their copyrights. And um, even on my campus, the contingent faculty typically do not have the rights. So it's something that's worth looking up and spending the time to do the research, as Rebecca said. And on the student side, and James, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that students create that work, that students own that copyright, that you as an instructor can't reuse their work without their permission. So that's, if you want to provide That's correct. Examples. Though there's the famous plagiarism case where the this company crew, grabbed all the student papers they could get and put it into a database and then professors could submit students papers to that organization to check for plagiarism. The students, several students sued claiming copyright violation and the court said that was a fair use because the purpose, that first factor, the purpose was completely different than why the student wrote the paper. And it wasn't a commercial substitute either. So we've got just another minute. Um, someone asked, and uh, I wish we had kind of started this with this question, but uh, is there a difference between copyright and intellectual property, or are they the same thing? Now, copyright is a subspecies of intellectual property. The, the, the four pillars of intellectual property are copyright, patents, trademarks, and trade secrets. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the lawyer's understanding. There may be a civilian understanding of that, but that's the lawyer's understanding. I mean, you, you, you may not know that you have copyright on everything you write until you've studied a little bit. You, you will know if you have a patent because getting a patent is a complicated process that takes a long time and, and lots of experts to help you get a patent. Um. Well, it looks like we are just at time. Uh, I really want to thank each of our panelists for the uh, excellent conversations today. Um, I'm going to hand it back over uh, to Megan. Uh, to kind of close this out here, um, but also, uh, you know, there's been um, there's been some great link sharing in the chat. If you haven't seen that, uh, you might want to go in and grab some of those um, those links. And also, of course, you can download the slides, and those links have been posted as well. So, Megan. Great, thank you, Rob, and thank you to our panelists. This was a great conversation. I know I learned a lot, and there were many, many questions that we couldn't get to, but we'll be creating some resources that we can share out. So be sure to follow our blog and stay tuned to WCET. If you have specific questions, you can reach out to our panelists. And again, this was recorded and we posted on our website. Be sure to visit our website. We provide tons of resources free and available to anyone and everyone. And we are in the process of designing our annual meeting seminar series which will touch on the subjects of inclusive teaching and access, as well as the future of higher education. So learn more on our website. And I'd like to thank our WCET supporting members, as well as our ongoing members and participants in our membership community, and our annual sponsors who underwrite much of our events and programs here at WCET. So, one final thank you and acknowledgement to everyone that helped provide good questions and participation in this webcast and our presenters. And we'll see you on the next WCET webcast. And don't worry, I'll send a link to the slides as well as a link to the recording as soon as it's available. Without further ado, we'll let you get on with the rest of your day. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, this was great. Bye all, thanks again. <laughs>